keep yourself on mute but please heavily use the chat um um and like you know i'll i'll have one eye on the chat so if you say anything i will see it and otherwise i'm going to walk through like some processes some story examples and everything uh, and the goal of the most i can do in one hour is inspire you i can't teach you anything i can just uh, inspire you to do more data work and you know go on and do start doing data stories and that's my goal for today just give you some starting steps and lots of inspiration um and yes so please engage with me please talk to me and i'm going to share my screen now we can see yes Let's, yes okay okay great awesome and thank you for everybody who has put their video on it's really nice to see faces and then if i'm boring you to death i can make out by your face expressions that uh, gurman nobody is getting anything so thank you so hello everyone um i am gurman bhatia i am an independent information designer and data journalist based in delhi two contacts name uh, based in delhi my work is a combination of journalism code and design um lately in 2021 i also started teaching so um like mostly people like you who are learning how to be journalists or people who are already journalists um or people who just want to learn how to make nice charts but if you're wondering you know what does the combination of journalism code and design look like or feel like um sometimes that means i take something like a press release and write some code to make a long line of tractors to show the scale of the uh, the tractor rally in delhi or sometimes i analyze a database of songs to show how the female solo has declined in bollywood or sometimes i simply stare at spreadsheets and databases to figure out who one should interview for a story or like just understand uh, which places should one look at what questions one should be asking in other words i tell stories with code and data um i also try to make them more visual in nature so take for instance a story for which we set up a camera to visualize pollution in delhi uh, what you can see in the photo is like a proper room that a photographer on the reuters team set up in a bureau in delhi um and it had like a hole for the camera to be camera lens to be able to capture the view but still be protected from heat rain everything and then we were able to you know create this time lapse of um what the skyline looked like next to the pm 2.5 line so the idea was that you know often times um, we say that the pm 2.5 in delhi will hit like 300 350 whatever uh, but it's very hard for us to understand how bad that is so the idea was that putting it next to a picture of what the sky looks like might create a more visceral reaction and make it much more real and this is the same time on different days this is the same day at different times and so the goal in a lot of the work, work that i am trying to do is to break the myth that data and numbers are boring um and they're not it's really if you if, if there is this thing that you know if your if your data is bo if your data is boring or yes it's because uh, you're looking at the wrong numbers so uh, good stories uh, have numbers that are interesting so question number 1 what do you think is a data story what makes a story a data story feel free to use the chat and yeah take a minute take take a moment to think about it and express according to you there's there are no wrong answers but according to you what makes a story a data story
Nobody saying anything. See if you... guys use the chat, please. Don't you? If you if you want to talk to me, you can unmute yourself and also say. Numbers in narratives, story which has accountability. Story that are based on facts. Shouldn't all stories be based on facts? Um, using data to support your story. Insights from stories data. behind data. Stories behind data. What do you mean by that? As in, how is the data collected? Collected, right? Yeah. A lot of reporting, in India, especially during COVID, a lot of reporting was around uh, data. Like, what are the stories behind data? Telling a story with data and numbers to create a narrative with proper storytelling techniques. Okay. Nice. Um, cool. Okay, thank you for participating. Um, I am going to give my idea of what I think is a data story. So, and this is like, this, this, there's no textbook de definition, okay? This is like just my brain on a slide. Um, so this is how I think of it. I think like a data story fulfills at least one of these two conditions. One, is that the crux of the story wouldn't exist without the data. You know, data like you, the lead per se wouldn't exist uh, without, the, without, the, without data. Like the lead is really, really dependent on the data. And the second was that the discovery of the story wouldn't have happened without data. So for example, um, maybe I want to talk about the school uh, where the where where there are very few toilets for girl students, and how that's leading to girls dropping out from school, hypothetically speaking. So if I was to find schools such as these, I would have to go to data. It's entirely possible that I don't uh, use a lot of numbers in the story. Maybe the story is entirely about the experience of these girls and experience of these students and how the whole problem is being managed in the school. But I found that school because of data. Um, so, you know, so that is one situation. And the other is, of course, like the lead of the story is really, really uh, dependent on data. So that's how I think of uh, data stories. One question. Does a data story need to have charts? Hmm. Rashi yeah, is not necessary. Not necessary. Exactly. Um, like some, you all are of course smart people, which is why nobody said a story with like lots of charts and numbers. Uh, they, you can have a data story that does not have a single number in it because data is not always about numbers. Photographs are data. Um, pictures are like um, photographs, pictures, same thing. Photographs are data. Shapes are data. Names are data. Like, so, you know, it's it's like everything is data at this day. And age. So it's not really necessarily dependent on numbers and charts. I'm using data for stories is something that newsrooms have been doing for ages, right? Like it's not like uh, a decade ago we realized that, oh my God, we need to use data for stories. We've been using data uh, for stories for a while now. So for example, you know, even um, when you talk about road accidents and like everything else, it's a data story, it's based on data. Uh, or like the story for which T. Ramachandran actually used a uh, database software to analyze election numbers back in 1991, by the way. So if somebody was doing it in 1991, of course you can do it in 2022, not a big deal. Um, census is something that you would see, uh, uh, you know, census is something you would report with as a person in a newsroom all the time. Or it could also be that, you know, you're using it for myth busting. 
uh, when I think the fashion designer went on and said that like a sari was a Hindu garment, um, Mint decided to use NSSO data to show that no, uh, people from all religions wear the sari. So sometimes, you know, data can, data is not just for stories about politics and, you know, um, everything else. It could also be a story or commentary on culture. Or it could be that, you know, you're discovering actual uh, issues within policy implementation. using data. Or uh, creating comparisons to create context on affordability of petrol in India, for instance. So as you can see, data journalism is nothing new. The only difference I think that has happened lately is that it's become more fancy uh, thanks to DataVerse. And especially like during the pandemic where all of us looked at more charts than like I've looked at more charts and everybody who wouldn't have consumed charts on a daily basis should uh, even decide whether to leave home today or whether to go to work. Um, so like charts have dictated our lives for the past two years. So we have started noticing it more. And so I've also realized that I speak to more journalists, more journalists have started realizing the importance of data numeracy after COVID because a lot of that dependent on like, you know, people understanding or reporters understanding what the case positivity rate is and stuff like that, because um, all your reporting was dependent on numbers and like, you know, in uh, understanding how uh, charts work. So if I am to talk about a data story, um, there are like three basic, very rudimentary steps to it. Like if I was to split it out in a very, very classic way. So one is like gathering the data or uh, sometimes it might use it, be like you have to extract it from somewhere. It's not like that easy to get the data. The second is analyzing the data. And the third is actually communicating the data. So the analysis would, part would also be where you're trying to find the story and trying to understand, like, you know, how, what is it that I want to say? Um, and the third part would be where you're being like, okay, this is, I need to figure out how do I see this? So step number one, getting the data. So this part is a little dense. So I'm going to zoom through it. And um, I think this is being recorded. So if you get lost, you can probably go back to it at some point in time. But I'm going to walk through some like technical bits and pieces as well. And of course, show some examples in the process. So uh, when you're looking for data, step one is, of course, like you first try and see if the data is already available. And if it's available in an Excel file, you can do your victory dance. Uh, that means you can, you know, easily take it to a spreadsheet software and do stuff with it. If you ever see the word CSV or TSV, that is also good because it, although the file might look something like this, it will open in Excel. So um, also a good thing. If it's a PDF, uh, which is what's going to happen a lot, a lot, lot when you're in India, uh, you don't get like pretty, pretty data sets. If it's a PDF, uh, Adobe has an online converter that you can use to turn it to a spreadsheet. There are also some other tools such as Tabula and Comet Docs that you can use um, to convert PDF tables to spreadsheets. Now, if none of that works and the data does not already exist in the public domain, you can ask for the data. Sometimes it means you are calling someone up and be like, hey, can you tell me this? Um, they might just tell you. You can also talk to researchers uh, for a story about pollution. We wanted um, this you know, kind of shape file or like geodata that you could put on a map on PM 2.5 things and we had this researcher I think in Sweden or somewhere that did some modeling to create these so uh, we just emailed them and 
the, they shared the data with us. So if you can talk to researchers that cover a specific topic, they might help you to. If none of these things work, uh, you can use your rights um, and like force people to give you information. So in the US, uh, there is something called FOIA, which people use, which is like the Indian RTI, uh, sorry, the American RTI little bit stronger than our RTI, but like still the idea is the same. So for this story, the it all started with a tip. The reporter covering the story, Ellen Gabler, got a tip from someone that skids are not being tested in time for something. Uh, like so, certain tests come really late and because of that, there are diseases that they're developing. Now, uh, in, in a particular hospital in Wisconsin, so she gets this tip. She's like, file a records request that asks for two things, which is what time is the sample collected and what time is the result given? Okay. It needs, needs to be like two, three days or something. So for every child, I don't want their personal information, but I want to get these two data points. Of course, it's the US data is maintained and everything. So she's able to get an answer to this. And she realizes it's a problem in the hospital. It's a rampant problem in the hospital. So she asked the same information for the state to, you know, show that this hospital is maybe an anomaly or a norm or whatever. She realizes it's a problem in the whole state. Then she's like, okay, let's look for other states. And she goes and files a record request for every state. She figures out it's a problem in the entire country. Um, and a lot of, uh, as she's calling up these hospitals and like, you know, trying to understand, a lot of them even fix it before the story is fine. So a lot of kids will have healthier lives today because this journalist went on to ask for two numbers for every child in the country that was born for a particular time period. So data can save lives. Um, in India, of course, you have the RTI. And I'm sure like not all data is locked. Like if you were to get that kind of data for all children in India, maybe that won't be possible. But um, we still have something, we have some law. And a lot of journalists have used it, for example, to um, get data on uh, birth, uh, death registrations during COVID to understand the scale of deaths that has happened in the country. So the Hindus reporting using the RTI has been uh, around excess mortality. And the way it works is um, you have to make sure you send it to the right place. So for example, it's a state department, you need to send it to the state portal. If it's something that the central government uh, manages, then you have to send it to central uh, central government portal. And um, if you mess up on the thing, it would be rejected. The way it works is that if it gets rejected and you send it to the right place, you can file an appeal. Um, if that gets approved, you can do your happy dance. Um, if you don't get a response, you can file a complaint. I think like if a response, if if, uh, an, if an officer does not give you the response at the right amount of time, um, they they are liable to pay like I, know, I think a twenty five thousand or twenty thousand fine. So you know you can force them to uh, send you stuff. Um, you can file it online. Cost ten, eleven, or sometimes thirteen rupees. So super cheap. You can create a weekly practice of filing RTIs. Uh, it's 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 excellent skill to build as a reporter. You can also like sometimes uh, you can also walk into an office and file in physical copy in an RTI. The responses you can get are like highly varied and sometimes like talking to sources before you file for an RTI can really help understand things too. So for example, Srinivas Kodali knew that the government, uh, this is the finance ministry, I think something that they collect. So knew that Ministry of Finance has some internal dashboard that they use, some internal tool system that they use. And within that, there is an export option to export the view as an Excel sheet. So he knew this from a source. So when he filed the RTI, he said that I want this, 
I want the RTI officer to go in, export the thing from the dashboard as an Excel file and send that to me. And he got like a very nice Excel sheet. So sometimes, you know, I'm talking to sources beforehand to understand how information is maintained can really, really improve the quality of the response too. And if you don't know it, um, you can get stuff like this also, uh, which is like a table printed, scanned, printed again, and then sent via mail. So um, RTI responses. RTI, is somebody saying something? Uh, okay. So RTI responses can like be highly, highly varied. Um, so the more you know about how the data is maintained, the more specific you can be in your request. Now there's one option um, of scraping the data. Now what does scraping mean? Scraping means that you take something that is in a web page as a table, as other information, could be anything. And uh, you turn it into a spreadsheet using some code. Um, this was something that I did for the story that after six years of me doing it, started circulating on the internet like a couple of days ago um, after Lata Mangeshkar passed away. So I did the story like six years ago and it was doing the rounds now. Um, but for the data for this came from scraping or uh, an online database. So actually a lot of people were, I got some emails from researchers that why are you using online databases for like stuff like this and everything. So there, there, there is like stuff that researchers, like I didn't write in the story, but I was not able to find like a well-structured database of these songs anywhere. So uh, the only thing I was able to find was this. There are some researchers that have like created books with like databases, but they don't have an online version that they could send to me for me to analyze. So what I did was I scraped this, but then I called up those researchers and was like, hey, these are my numbers. What are your numbers from your research? And I matched those up. And they did not line up 100%, but they lined up like 95, 96%. So uh, it was good enough that I felt like I can go ahead with the purpose of my story, whatever it was, it would line up in that uh, for that purpose. So um, sometimes if you're using, you know, tricky databases, you can double check with others too. Um, and the more people you talk to, which is a good practice to have anyway, that if you're doing any analysis of kind, um, of any kind, going to experts who understand that domain to uh, check uh, that if your findings seem valid or not. One thing that like I think most valuable stories come out of is when you create your own data uh, because then the stories that you're doing would be unique. Uh, nobody else has that data, so nobody else has the story. So uh, creating your databases uh, can be extremely, extremely powerful for a lot of work. Um, when COVID happened, Reuters started collecting their own data set of using cases and deaths and other things as well. Later on, we also started capturing things like uh, who was getting vaccinated, what are the different phases of vaccination in different countries and everything. And uh, it was interesting because this started out as a journalistic exercise. So we were collecting this data so that... Uh, one issue with relying on external data sets such as our world and data or John Hopkins was that whenever there would be data dumps of specific countries, you would see these spikes in these data sets. But I would not know why is there a spike. And a lot of times it would be like, you know, they are resolving previous numbers and adding them in. But when a reporter is checking and manually entering in the database, they will go and check. And they had to find out the reason whenever there was an anomaly. So we would put disclaimers on our pages within the tracker uh, when that happened. And because of all of this and the information that we were collecting, Reuters like also started like formed a business model around this, where they would sell this information to Amazon. Uh, and uh, when today, when you ask Alexa, who can get vaccinated in Delhi, it's getting or like in India or in Somalia or 
in the US, the response it would give would come from the data that Reuters collects. Um, so, which which was quite interesting as well, like how that instead of just Reuters is a B two B as well as a B two C company. So, uh, just in addition to selling stories, they also found a way to sell data um, for uh, other places. And like this is uh, something. This was the Reuters tracker that we built that was powered by all the data that our journalists were collecting. Um, for another story during the pandemic, we wanted to figure out. This was very very early, like March, um, March twenty twenty, when we wanted to visualize how uh, more and more people in China went under lockdown. Like that's what what we wanted to visualize, and to do that, then you know we had a reporter who we had a bunch of reporters because all these bulletins were in Mandarin, so they went through different bulletins to figure out at what date, what place, uh, went under lockdown and everything. And one thing that I realized during this exercise is that how hard it was to access the Chinese census. So for me to even get information on how many people live in a province or a city, it was a nightmare. Because apparently China sells census information in CDs that you need to buy from the government. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm grateful for the Indian census after dealing with the Chinese census. Um, and then we were able to, you know, show how um, the the lockdown had progressed to more than 500 million people being affected. Um, or this one which was about the Hong Kong protests. So we want to understand, we wanted to understand uh, how more and more people, more and more violence was being used uh, against the protesters when the Hong Kong protests were happening. And to do that, again, we did a similar thing where we scoured through video footage, we scoured through photographs, uh, police press releases and everything to, make a list of what kind of violence was used on different protests and then you know um went on to visualize it the story was actually like a pulitzer finalist as well so we were doing very unique work because this data set otherwise didn't exist so we went through the pain of collecting it and then also like noticed that how police changed policies. Now, this was things that complemented the data analysis was that like when there were changes in police policy, um, the use of violence became easier. Basically, they would remove restrictions for the police to use violence. And uh, as the policy changed, you could see a spike in the kind of violence that was being used. Um, the New York Times used to do complete this like create this list of everybody that Trump would insult on Twitter um so created this online database but also did like a double spread on in print um and then it was interesting because then they were able to you know use it to analyze and do a different story um once he got elected you know the who he was interested um uh, who he was insulting changed over time so, you know, um, you create a database for one thing and you can then use it for other things too. In the US, uh, police shootings has been a big thing. And uh, now the FBI has a database of police shootings. But what uh, but it started with actually the Washington Post and other uh, publications creating their own databases. So sometimes, you know, the uh, sometimes citizens coming in and like newsrooms coming in and creating their own databases can also put pressure on the government to uh, follow suit and create official versions of the same. Um, and th this is about uh, mass shootings. That, again, another thing that the Washington Post maintains uh, during COVID, um, you know, like um, 
Dainik Bhaskar sent 20 rep- 30 reporters across 27 districts on the banks of Ganga to count dead bodies. So in a place where everybody was talking about the undercount of deaths and everything, and you know he maybe did not have the time to file RTIs or did not rely on responses because it would take time. Sometimes even the act of going out there and counting can uh, talk a lot about scale. So. Um, one thing that i have after talking about data sets is that um i maintain a data set of data sets about india so um, if you're looking for like wait 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 ha huh. um if you're if you're you know like where do i start where do i find this data where do i find that data i will paste a link in the chat that you could refer to to find different data sets about india um and that is link number 1 now next uh, another thing that would happen after you have gotten the data is that you would try and clean it and um how do you clean data excel is great for this kind of thing uh, excel generally is great i would say like if you are someone who is not worked with data at all excel is a great starting point um, 90% of what we and the analysis we do as journalists could be doing done in excel so excel is a very powerful tool google sheets excel whatever you want to use uh, so any spreadsheet software libreoffice for that matter it's fine um it, it's a good place to start another tool that is quite helpful um, in cleaning data is called open refine um it's a free tool that you can download to your computer comp- download on your computer but works in your browser so um how open refine could be helpful for is that for example uh, i use it a lot for the music and song stories that i did because what would happen is say lata mangeshkar sings a song it would show up once as a song in the movie and then somebody tries to compile it in an album like you know mix it best of lata mangeshkar it will show up again in that and it's a duplicate uh, but maybe it's spelled differently in one album aja has double a in another album it has one a you know all of that would happen so open refine will look at these similar things and also and flag hey do you think these are the same thing um so if in one place i am called gurman bhatia and another row i'm called gurman bhatia with like a y or something again open refine would be like hey uh, are these the same person so extremely useful um, for companies people's names and you know things where you need to do this fuzzy matching kind of thing so that's also a good tool uh, to keep in mind now i have found my data i've cleaned my data and i want need to analyze it and find a story that's hard um that's perhaps the hardest part uh, like you know even as journalists is as you know like finding those stories are, is kind of the most difficult aspect somebody in this said in the chat said the uh, figuring out a narr- narrative from a random set of completely unrelated numbers yeah that's that's hard and sometimes there is no story um so a, a lot of times there is no story in it um and a lot of people say that you know should i start with the story or should i start with the data uh, one thing that i've realized over time is that when you start out with a story like you have a good strong hypothesis uh, that is evidenced in something else the likelihood of ended, ending up with something in the end is high if you start with like here's an interesting data and i want to find something in it it's kind of a needle in a haystack sort of a thing and the success like the i the uh, the thing that you would be succeed in this the chances are quite low so background reading around a particular subject you know looking at other stories looking at other work other reporting uh and then forming a strong hypothesis to start out with will really really help out so there are few things you can do with data right you can use data to provide context uh, into something that's happening how many people have watched the movie spotlight you could use your zoom zoom hand or yeah right a lot of people in case people haven't um i Oh, okay. Lots of people are raising their hands. 
those who haven't i recommend uh, you watch it it's a data journalism movie um so you know like who thought data journalists would be represented um in screen and there's like very fa- very like amazing scene in the movie in which somebody is typing into a spreadsheet you know uh, all data journalists trip over the scene it's like this is a representation for us or data jo- or journalist is opening up a spreadsheet and typing in data how very exciting uh, not trip over the scene and the story that is about um, how child sex- sex- sexual abuse was happening by the catholic church um, was discovered because of an excel sort uh, so you know the, they there was no downloadable spreadsheet or a pdf they had these annual directories published a se- several books and reporters manually went through it and circled names that went on leave then somebody went on and filled them in a spreadsheet and once they did and sorted the names it were the same people and they were able to identify all the priests that perhaps were being um, you know sent on leave because they had abused children just as thing just to let things die down so in the end uh, 87 boston priests uh, who had sexually abused children were identified and then action was taken against them so if you're thinking that data journalism means you need to learn how to code uh, this is a classic example of how that is not true at all it is more about thinking in terms of data more about thinking in terms of like how data can help me answer a question or find a pattern um, rather than writing a bunch of code so uh, this is another story that i did when i was at hd and uh, here the idea was that you know there are lots of dummy candidates that would be set up so basically if congress has a gurman bhatia contesting from a seat bjp will pay if you uh, independents called gurman bhatia to contest from the same seat to confuse voters um, and this used to happen a lot now to solve that uh, the election commission is decided to put photographs on the ballot in the last general elections we had actual pictures of candidates on the ballot itself because of this very problem but this story is from 2017 when that was not the case so all i did was like half an hour of excel work to figure out um, how many seats had people from the same name contesting and uh, yeah um, so there were like three kulbir so there was like four kulbir singhs from a seat and um, four gurpreet singhs from another seat so like you know you, then i think i called some of them up as well uh, on like whatsapp and uh, in some cases uh, it, you can also look at how if you add up the votes of all the dummy candidates if that's more than the difference between the first and second place so you know if that actually had a difference so like it's not complicated data work but can still be interesting uh, to see again example of context um using comparisons is really really important so sometimes uh, simplifying things so we, the, we when i was at the palm beach post we did this analysis on how heroin overdoses were increasing in the state and for that we requested data on different like every time somebody came to a hospital it was logged in a database and uh, we got anonymized records of everybody who came to a hospital for anything for 5 6 years i think and uh, with the code you could identify how many of those were foreign overdose so after filtering that like basically it was like 50 million entries or something so it was like computer running slowly 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 processing that thing but after analyzing those 50 million rows we only wrote these two sentences that's all the insight we got from them and that's all we needed it for it for so sometimes just because you have a lot of data doesn't mean you have to like dump it all on the reader sometimes like you know even picking out what is the information that is most relevant to the reader in the sense so if we, i was trying to talk about the scale of overdoses i did it this way that you know in florida in 2010 a person with heroin poisoning showed showed up at a hospital emergency room every two days in 
to 2015 it was every 90 minutes so like you know just two sentences out of like i don't know how many hours of data work um, so something to think about some common angles that you can approach when um, dumped with a data could be look at outliers places that behave differently um, so this is a story this is early from the pandemic i think it was april or may or something like that so we like looked at all places that had not gotten a single coronavirus case um, or where local transmission had not happened so where were things good or uh, this story where we looked at like people who were not ceos and uh, presidents of companies um, and attending the world economic forum who were the people who were people like you and me uh, normal human beings or artists um, and were ending up in like the global uh, global event it could also be a best worst sort of a question so in a lot of places in the coronavirus dashboard that we made at Reuters we had these um triggers or like you know automated sentences or text that would show up so how many countries are still near the peak of their infection curve or who is vaccinating faster than in any other place these are all old screenshots by the way so india is not leading the world in daily infections reporting i hope um so so that um so like you know uh, that could be one way of showing context another obvious thing is just genuine trends so something is like how is the islamic state being removed from syria again old story or how the female solo is declining so just generic trends evidenced in data and uh so we used to tell that story interestingly so how do you tell interesting stories uh, how do you tell data stories in an interesting manner so there's the myth of course is that data in database is impersonal dry and boring whereas uh, it need not be so um you can use visuals to make things interesting but you can also use words it it word, the words bit is also like i have a lot of ideas personally but need to be better at it for myself uh, as well so one thing data can help you is um, put things into context for examples people would understand so for example if you're talking about um, how bad indian cities or not indian cities are in terms of pollution you place it next to the rest of the world to show that you know we are much much worse than majority of the world and annotations are a great way to do this so for this story you know uh, i placed annotations to say that hey oil producing nations have the cheapest petrol people in developed countries are spending less than 2% of their daily gdp per capita uh indian india a person might be spending 21% of their G- daily gdp per capita um and some indian states are worse off than a lot of underdeveloped uh, countries or when talking about waste this is of course for our american audience so they place the scale of waste water created by in the ganga every day with a uh, charge of liberty or uh, the story where i talked which was about um, the fastest man in every country um there is this annotation that i use that when bowl crosses the finish line the second fastest man america tyson gay is more than a meter behind because this is for an indian audience i say it's about the length of a cricket bat so putting you know a more visual comparison for the reader to understand that okay she's saying about a meter what does that mean or uh, this one that i showed earlier um then i was lining up tractors and you know i place these markers that this is now you have reached a kilometer this was the actual length of the republic day parade when this was happening uh, now you have reached 1000 tractors that's the length of you know the havada bridge or that's the length of a cricket pitch or like you know placing these markers another way is humanize the numbers with people because 
people don't remember numbers people remember people so um, a story that i did uh, for the indian elections for this i wanted to show the scale of the elections so i decided to use the photograph because it was on the ballot to avoid the same name confusion and we had these you know new data new data that the government was collecting for me um they were collecting for themselves but of course indirectly they also collecting for me to create this beautiful grid of everybody who contested the election and then you have to scroll 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 before you get to the first one so um one way i could have written that you know only 9% of candidates are female or i can put this grid and let the reader experience that the latter of course is a much more powerful way than writing that in a sentence um this is a, another piece from reuters graphics um, that looked at the scale of the refugee uh, crisis uh, when people were leaving um, when the rohingya crisis was happening so use in this case we do not have actual pieces but we used illustrations of actual humans to show how that crowd increased over time or this one that article 14 did on uh, by using 100 indians so they took the stories of 100 indians and wrote obituaries um to commemorate lives we lost after covid on the same um team um the new york times wrote many obituaries for 1000 people after uh, the us crossed 100000 covid deaths so they put obits out for 1% of the front page of the paper so like putting that much real estate is also a uh, you know uh, a strong decision for a newspaper to make and they write it that the 1000 people here reflect just 1% of the toll none were mere numbers and um like they're very small obituaries so things like Devin Elgin, fifty-six Chicago, followed in his father's footsteps as a pipe fitter, or Carl Reid, sixty-two Chicago, squeezed in every moment he could with his only grandchild. So, like you know, just humanizing the numbers, and even if you can't have faces all the time, um, thinking what is a more human way to tell the story, to talk about the scale, is something to think about. Another beautiful project that does the same is called Stolen. This is by an artist and not a like journalist but adrian what adrian did for this one was that for every year that a person lived colored their picture for one minute so the empty space uh, talks about lives not lived so if ayana stanley jones lived for 7 years before she was shot uh, her picture lacks color another way is that you zoom zoom into a data point and report so um uh, now this is from the print um and they, they talk about bellwether uh, seats so bellwether seats are basically if that seat who which party the party that wins that seat also wins the election there is no scientific logic to bellwether seats but i like the idea that you have identified something from a data and then you're going there and reporting on it so what if we apply the same concept elsewhere you know so it could be that you find that candidate that keeps losing badly in elections but keeps contesting and write a profile of them um or you report on the ground from the rural district in odisha where you have identified like it has a consistently high positivity rate um could be anything um uh, could be a one coed what one coed school in the data that didn't have any female students what happened there what went wrong or another that might have been the most number of books um, in their library so you write about their book collections so, you know you find the school with the most number of books uh, by, because the government does collect information on how many books are in a school's library or how many computers are there in a school so um if that information is being collected maybe you just find that school and go there and report and talk about what's happening there and i'm going to okay i'm going to zoom through this one 
because I'm going to close in five minutes so that you can talk a little bit for 10 minutes. Um, so one thing is that you can insert the reader in the story. So it could be like um, when you were 12, DVDs were popular and like, you know, I asked for your age and then I talk about the history of tech based on your experience or as you're on a page, talk about, uh, this, this was an editorial about uh, gun, the gun issue in the US um, and basically like the shots kept increasing or uh, this one look this was like peak of the pandemic where there was a lot of death around around us so this one talked about someone was dying every, in the world every 16 seconds um, this one is about elections so if I give you my demographics I would tell you um, which candidates uh, line up with your demographic. Uh, because oftentimes we talk about, you know, there are no politicians like us. Like, you know, politicians are people with criminal. So this one is actually to, you know, relate to that. That are there politicians like us? Are there politicians like you and me? Or this one, um, which talks about wealth. So after you give your net worth, uh, compares millions of, dollars that rich people have or spend on multiple things with your uh, things so for example it says mike bloomberg spent 11 million of his own money on a 60 second super bowl ad that was 0.018 percent of his net worth for you that's equivalent to 13 dollars a movie ticket so him spending 11 million dollars is the same as you watching a movie in a theater so, um, you know, putting that into perspective by um, making it relatable or to talk about the Syrian refugee crisis for an American audience, Al Jazeera America would place um, using population density. So saying that, you know, if it's so big that if you placed it uh, somewhere in close to Texas, if you placed uh, refugees there, it would cover all of New Mexico. Um, and half of Texas. So, you know, again, putting it contest and how it matters or relates to me, makes it more relatable for me. And something that I was talking about earlier, data is not just numbers. Data can also be photos and illustrations. Um, this is this is from more of a standpoint of visualizing things as well. So I when I'm talking about pollution in North India, I can make a line chart like this, but then I can also do this, right? Something we looked at before. Um, my one of my favorite data projects is Dollar Street by Gapminder, and uh, Gapminder is the organization by Hans Rosling. Hans Rosling, if you don't know, you should read the book. You should Google and watch his videos. Very powerful data storyteller. And um, Gapminder, uh, sorry, Dollar Street is actually the brainchild of Anna Rosling, his daughter, and uh, I think daughter or daughter-in-law, one of the two, but. Um, what she visioned was that we'll send photographers across the world to people's houses and we'll ask them to photograph daily objects of their lives. So in this slide, for example, you're seeing the beds of places, uh, people who might earn household, have a household income of $27 a month. What does their bed look like compared with someone who makes $14,000 a month? And you can also like look at people's teeth. How do teeth uh, look with in households of varying incomes? And you can look at their books and you can look at their floors and you can look at their hands and you look at their toothbrushes and toothpaste and um, where do they worship? So like, you know, um, how do they wear, wash their hands? So like, you know, very daily activities and daily objects. So I can talk about inequality or I can show inequality to you using these pictures. And the latter, of course, is much more powerful. This one I've talked about already. Um, this is Mona Chalabi, of course. If you don't follow her on Instagram, you should. She's awesome, hand draws data viz and does like really cool work. Uh, this is another Instagram account. Uh, so this was a story about underage marriage. And to illustrate the decrease, use like henna, 
because of course it's about marriage so very illustrative approach to communicating something like that another nice instagram account is indian pixels um so this one talks about um, how does like you know how do prices of the same thing vary across countries and simplifies it and closing remarks so um one thing that i recommend to everybody is a free book on the internet called curious journalist guide to data by jonathan stray and it starts with this dedication for every journalist who has ever thought they're bad at math what if you're wrong so if you're scared of math i would it's a, it's a slightly written for a us centric audience but a lot of the things he talks about are global so even the examples might be american um the uh, logic is not the concepts are not so i recommend this um you should join the data meet google group um it's a community where data folks across india talk to each other so sometimes you know when i can't find a data set i go there and i see has ever, anybody asked anything about this data set before so it's entirely possible someone has and i might find it if not i can go and ask a question myself and someone might help so it's very few journalists a lot of like policy folks open data people and uh, researchers that work in different domains i have a link of resources um that is of like law uh, communities you can join um blogs you can read podcasts you can listen to there is a lot 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 uh, that you can do if any of this is interesting to you so there is that um and if you are interested in charts a uh, good tools to start out with are data wrapper and flourish free to start with and there's a lot you can do in them so uh, both of them are uh, i would recommend trying out and um, you can explore indian data sets through the link that i shared before uh just like data journalism is just like normal journalism so it's nothing special it's the core crux of it is still like your actual reporting and the story it's just a way to make your reporting more empirical and real that's all you know so if i'm talking to people i'm data is just another source so if i've spoken to five human beings why can't i also look at five data sets and you know add more layers to the story so um, your data set is just another source so yeah uh, all the best and hope you this is inspiration enough for you to go play with stuff and i know i am like on time but we started late so i think i i can hang around for 5 10 minutes for people's questions if people have questions and this is where you talk and i listen and there are lots of okay i can see two hands anjali uh, yes, hello ma'am uh, can you yeah uh, so ma'am i had a question so when you are dealing with data that has gaps in it so for example if i'm looking at the import export data of agricultural commodities there is data missing for a particular year or for a particular product and since i don't have the resources to go and collect this kind of data for myself how do i deal with this so it could be like one way is to just communicate it to the reader that this is missing and be aware of all the inferences that you can't do so um you can't make so be absolutely transparent that this is what's happening another way could be that you look at alternatives maybe there are researchers that uh, estimate these numbers using surveys um to bridge those very gaps so talking to industry experts can really help uh you know figure out if there is any proxy you can use for what's missing so for example a lot of times i'm i know it might not be possible you just don't have the data but in some time in some cases you might be able to come up with a proxy one i keep coming back to it but one example was of course that there was humongous under reporting of deaths so uh, of covid numbers so then we came up with the method that we look at death registrations and look at like you know how much is more than normal so we came up with the proxy in that scenario so i think like also thinking of proxies uh, of what you are trying to show can be helpful 
and uh, talking to industry experts people who understand the domain could help you go in that direction now i have one more question so since you're talking about humanizing data so for example hmm. if i'm an economy reporter and i'm writing about something like capital expenditure or government borrowing so in this case uh, what what are the ways in which you would humanize this data i like in in this ways of course like sometimes you just like have to tell the numbers and that's fine too uh, like sometimes it's just that but i think like and maybe it does not make sense and you don't have the space to do it but how does it actually affect human life uh, how does it change people's experiences could be one way to talk about like what's the impact of this right so um, that could be one way but yeah it's totally okay to also have stories where you're just telling the numbers because there's nothing more that you can do i'm just a last question what are the checks that we should make before we write a story like how do you you know check the accuracy of the data i have i will answer that question with a link um so that we can go on to questions from other people so give me one second and so joy you can tell me your question while i paste the answer to this uh sure ma'am uh so ma'am uh, like you mentioned that uh, you are a journalist who code and who visualize so according to you like your suggestion to budding journalists like us what's more important to be a good storyteller or to be a good coder or is it important that to be like to uh, for a good data journalist to learn a lot of coding or just a bit coding is okay or not at all you don't need any coding you just need to be a good storyteller so what say your take on this story is supreme there is nothing more important than telling a good story because at the heart of it you are still a journalist you can always collaborate with people who can code um so you know to bridge that gap it's it's not necessary that you have to learn how to code you can have friends uh, who know how to code you can have teammates who know how to code and you can collaborate i think thinking about things through a data lenses like developing that thinking is much more crucial and that's a more of a reporting skill than anything else um so i would not at all uh, put great amount of uh, importance in learning how to code absolutely not over time the need to learn how to the need to learn to code is also like going down so because you have all these tools that can do so much without writing a single line of code um so i think like focusing more on building that reporting muscle and thinking through things in a more empirical and you know um logical data science manner is more helpful than um actually learning how to code that's my take on this so like if you want like can i follow up so if you want to yeah. set our ways in this industry so like is it important that we should know a bit of coding so that uh... i think like as long as you are able to achieve what you need to um so it's more important like i am going to give and like you are going to add an end uh, a story in your portfolio right so as long as you are able to achieve that story a good story a powerful story an important story how you do it nobody knows even if you said you know how to code i don't think the editor interviewing understand what you can or cannot do um so like i don't i don't think that like have good strong stories in your portfolio um the end result matters much much more than anything else a portfolio will set you apart in the industry and nothing else um riddhima hi kaman um so i i'm working on the story right now so um it's talking about this um, dropout rates in ninth grade for delhi government schools and the numbers are really high in 2015 16 like they're at 45% and the government recently came out with an rti report which said that in 2021 it dropped down to 13% and it just doesn't make sense because during that time it was covid and you know students were going back to villages so it, it's just it doesn't make sense and i've tried to contact governments and like um, I've tried to contact the Delhi government and a few industry experts, but I haven't been able to contextualize that 
through anyone so like in that situation have you been in that situation and what would you do in a situation like that so you you're saying that they're not responding to the rti is that it uh, i asked them to ask them to tell me contextualizing the numbers because they're saying oh it's because of these these, these reasons but uh, uh-huh. they're not explaining the drop so i've emailed them tried to call them but they've not really responded to that maybe because i'm a student journalist i don't know but in that situation like what do have I- you filed an rti no i i was not the one who filed i found it uh, through a news article so i think like uh, whatever so this data that you're talking about is also actually maintained at the uh, central level so i don't know if you've seen it at all but there is this amazing data set called udice i've actually like covered the drops in 2015 20, 2016 so this sounds way too familiar uh, but i use this data set wait i am udice plus or something it's called now no so um this one sure so i think like if you're not getting responses from the state government you can also go and ask for the raw data actual data um from udis people because they maintain like they collect all this information for the entire country not just delhi um and i'm sure like the first the education department in delhi would have it and then they would pass it to them but uh, there is this outlet this this place where the, all the data is there too um so for them to contextualize or drop it might be hard but you can also look at other factors you can look at for example of the people who are dropping out um are do they come from a particular gender or uh, do they come from a particular religion um you know like i i don't know and these are all questions that pop up in my head that if there is a drop that's happening uh, who is it affecting the most is it affecting certain group more than others and all this data is actually collected at for every student in the country whether they go to a public or private school um so yeah i think like also checking up with your dice folks might be helpful and also to, another thing to do might be also to talk to researchers who work on this particular subject so i know for example um, cpr in delhi um, has a very strong uh, accountability initiative folks do a lot of work around education so i so spoke, talking to them so i spoke to them and uh... so they have a research paper so basically the government is saying that uh, they had this program from 2015 16 till 2019 mm. which was to reduce the dropout rates and then it stopped during covid and due mm. till the time program was on it was as high as 40% and when the covid thing happened when things went bad that's when they're saying the drop happened mm. to 13% so maybe it was because kids started going like i don't know why that is cpr had a report on what was going on at that point but they have not uh, given they stopped it in 2019 so they don't know what happened after that so i think the only the government can help with this i will try and look at this link you've shared thank you all the best thank you yeah any more questions guys yeah uh, i have a question yeah hi gurman uh, my question is like for example if i take ncrb data or something like the increase in numbers they could say could be one that the cases have increased or they could say like one another this thing could be that uh, the reporting has become better so something that we heard yeah. for covid also like you know some states have better testing and their reporting is better so how do i kind of look at like what do i do when i see a data set i find a pattern what more should i do to kind of ensure that the what i'm getting from the data is sort of what the actual talk what is actually humans. happening talk to humans um like instead of spreadsheets uh, clear it up with that so uh, it, in the case of crime data it could be you know talking to lawyers or talking to people who work in justice and you know understand that domain better or people who have uh, one of the things that i know rukmini used to do for a lot of stories that she has done around crime was talk to people who maintain these statistics so uh, the statisticians in uh, government offices are often the most knowledgeable and most ignored people uh, so if you talk to them um, they can also shed light that's how uh, rukmini noticed that uh, reported on like there used to be this 
pattern where a lot of rape cases won't be logged as rape cases within NCRB um, because say if it was a rape that ended up in murder it would be logged as a murder and not as a rape because of the principal offense rule so uh, this was something that Rukmini got to know after talking to uh, a statistician in in the NCRB office so you know sometimes like talking to these people can really really help you understand the reason of something. So I think like once you've found the pattern, uh, it's important to ask why, which is what Rhythma is also talking about, that like there is something that's happening. I want to find out why is it happening. So uh, when you chase that why and you talk to people to understand it, you will uh, find out answers. I think we can take one more question. Kusum. Sorry, yes, um, I can stay and talk forever. It's about Adasa. Um, yeah. So, yeah, my, uh, so my question is like, uh, how do you judge that a particular story is worth having a data? Because like dealing with data is very time consuming. So how do you take that decision about any story? So I think like we every day, every story can be a data story, but every story need not be a data story also, right? So uh, unfortunately, like from someone who understands data and is passionate about data, I read it every story and I'm like, why didn't they get this data and why didn't they add this data? So like it is uh, always a question of time as you're saying, but uh, you can also think about the low hanging fruit. So one thing that I tell people that would like, how do I start with data journalism? And I say that one good way to start is that can data enhance your story with one sentence? You know, can you add one sentence of context using data that you wouldn't have otherwise? Um, then gradually you move to, can I have one paragraph of context that I wouldn't have otherwise? Um, can I have a lead uh, that I wouldn't have otherwise? So it really depends if it's like, it's a, the data should move the story forward, I think, or help you go deeper. If it's not helping you go deeper or taking the story forward, then maybe it's not worth, worth it. Um, so yeah, if it helps you advance the story in a way, it makes it more holistic, gives more context to them, and you have the time to do it. I guess like those things could be um, things okay. to think about. Thank you. Yeah, yes, I Ash. I, uh, last, last. Okay. Yes. So who was the last person? Yeah. Anybody else? Ashish has yeah, his yeah. hand. Yeah, Ashish. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, hello, ma'am. So uh, there are some stories that need data to prove uh, the argument that they are making. Say for let's say, say for example the deprivation deprivation of education in Jammu and Kashmir. But the, uh, because of the shutdowns and lockdowns that have happened in the previous years, not I'm not talking about the COVID lock pandemic lockdown, but the security mm -hmm. reasons. But you see, mm -hmm. there are, there is no data about how many times the government or army has locked down, say, Srinagar, for, like, for, for example. So what do mm -hmm. I do now? Because I have an argument. I have why. Mm -hmm. But I don't have data to support my argument. Uh, so what do I do in that case? So if you think of ways if you can collect that data, uh, I don't know if uh, maybe... Internet, for example, we do have information on internet shutdowns, right? Um, if that's a starting point, assuming that when then you check out that whenever there's an internet shutdown, was the city shut down as well. So it could be a starting point, and then you can go back to news articles for it or researchers with it. So I think like the idea here is to think of again something that we talked about earlier. If there are proxies that you can find, or if you can collect your own data set. That could be one way of approaching things. A lot of times I understand that will not be possible and I don't have an answer. Like, what do you do then instead of like giving up? Um, but um, yeah, think if there are approaches that you can take um, that will that might be tedious, but will still get you the result that you're or close to the result that you're looking for. Okay, thank you. Yeah, all right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, As Seva Gurman. It's been very insightful. And uh, thank, thanks for taking time for us. Uh, and it uh, would be great if you could uh, share your presentation because uh, a lot of people would be interested in looking at it. 
Sure, sure. I'll email it to you. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any final word uh, for the one couple of sentences? All the best. <laughs> All the best. And if you make things, please send me links um, to stuff that you do. I love right. to look at new things that people make. So uh, my Twitter DMs are always open. My email ID is quite public. So if you reach out to me, I will respond. Uh, that's a promise. I don't know when I will respond, but I will 100% respond. So, um, so like, yeah, feel free to share stuff that you create and all the best. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, mom. Thank you, mom. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye.